Hi, Tyler at Inner Fidelity here. Uh, as you may have noticed, we've got some cool videos that have been coming out. Jana came up here from the New York office to shoot some videos. And before she came up, we had a chat and she thought it'd be fun to do some question and answers. So we talked some over and uh, that's what we're gonna do right now, some Q and A. So we'll uh, just get going right on the list. <clears throat> What's the most least fun or easiest, hardest parts about your job? Well, the most fun, of course, is uh, I get to listen to a lot of headphones. I like listening to headphones. Um, I like measuring the headphones. I like the process. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, it is hard, the process, for me, for sure, because I'm sort of ADD, I'm, I go everywhere and in, in my head and I, I, I tend to actually do better when I do more than one thing at once. Um, but that's not actually very helpful for the process of doing the, the review because it's pretty fine tuned at this point. I go through the process. So it's hard, it's work, um, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, enjoy going to the shows and meeting with people. That's, that's certainly a lot of fun. Um, the hardest part about the job, um, well, one is that I, I do spend a lot of time shipping stuff and boxing up stuff and getting equipment from manufacturers. That's, that's a hard part of the job, uh, certainly. Um, John Atkinson one time said to me, uh, you should write reviews like you were writing them for your best friend. And if you write, if you tell your best friend about a, a product, and leave out a couple of the warts of that product, then you won't, that won't be your best friend for very long because you've given them advice, but you didn't tell them about something or other that was a problem. So, um, so I tend to be as truthful as I possibly can. And that oftentimes means being somewhat critical about stuff and manufacturers really don't like that. PR people really don't like that. I've had manufacturers come tell me, you know, kind of flat out, I'm not gonna send you the headphone yet. We're gonna wait for a while because uh, it could be, you know, it's, it's not good. You say something and then everybody on the forum says it. So, or, or they're talking about it. And of course, uh, that, that can not be good public relations for those guys. So, um, the press, I believe strongly in the press's position as the fourth estate and that it acts as a, um, a proxy for the people, you. And uh, if so, I feel like I have to do those things, but it does make it pretty hard sometimes to get headphones in here. <laughs> so that's, that's a pretty hard part of the job. Um, oh, well, that was the next question. The politics of headphone reviewing and maintaining relationships with manufacturers and headphone designers. Well, oddly, um, I have pretty good relationships with the designers. They actually like what I do a lot, I think. Um, they enjoy it. They know how hard it is to make a headphone. And um, I've had engineers come to me from headphone companies and go, yep, yeah, we knew about that. Or... I'd, I'd call them or I, I'd uh, email them and, and say, this pad seems wrong. It was too, I, I'm thinking of a particular instance. And uh, the manufacturer said, uh, I, I actually, I'll take it back. It was after the review and, the, and was in contact with the engineer at some point later. And he said, yeah, you're exactly right. We had a problem with that headphone, the pad, the, the, uh, um, the Chinese OEM maker, had sourced the wrong pad um, material that w that we didn't specify and we c didn't catch it until it was out in the wild already. Um, I, I had an interesting time with Vocal and their Spirit One because they had a problem with diaphragms crinkling. And um, we worked through it and Vocal was absolutely great. I, I mentioned their name because they were absolutely great. Um, in my relationship with them and throughout the, pr the process of um, talking about that diaphragm on that headphone. And um, so they were real appreciative. Sometimes the manufacturers are really brave. They go, nope, we want to know your opinion. It's important. We know that your opinion is important to people out there, so we'll get you the headphone. 
and um, Focal has absolutely been great about that. Um, do I like traditional hi-fi and two-channel at all, and do I have a system? Well, yeah, I love a good uh, hi-fi system. I love being able to hear really good hi-fi systems when I have a chance. It's, it's where I had my first experiences with really great quality sound. Um, was in some recording studios. Uh, and then later in life when I started listening to headphones on airplanes when I was repairing scanning electron microscopes, and didn't get that high quality sound, I was very disappointed. And in, in a way, it's what drove me into um, starting Headroom and trying to uh, uh, making headphone amplifiers um, and then also uh, to make the headphones sound better. And then, then also to when I sold headphones and wrote about them in the marketing copy and the, and the uh, sales copy at Headroom, I was, again, brutally honest uh, about that. But um, uh, I had a fairly good system um, quite some time ago that I had up, and I also have children and cats and dogs, and it got pretty badly damaged a couple of times, and I took it down, and I've never gotten the speakers repaired. And um, so my, my two-channel system that I love is right here. Um, that's a Harbeth uh, HLP3S2, I think is the model number of the speaker. Um, and uh, headroom equipment that we made, the uh, desktop amp and power supply, and then the two Class D power amplifiers and the stands. Um, I, I really like a good near field system. I mean, I like a good system that fills a room, but a lot of people and myself, I couldn't afford to dedicate a whole room of my house when it was filled with kids and dogs. So I could always retire to this system if I wanted to listen on speakers. Um, but I love two-channel audio, you bet. There's, there's great stuff. Um, it's it's lo a lovely, lovely thing. It's not what I ended up doing, and so, um, so I don't have a big two-channel system anymore. Uh, thoughts on headphone forums? Woo-hoo, hot potato. Paper's going to catch on fire here any second. Let me say something about forums in general. I've spent a lot of times on forums. I spent a lot of times on headphone forums. I spent a lot of time on uh, he um, Headwise when it first started, and uh, I spent a lot of time on HeadFi when it began to take over. Uh, and when splinter groups happen, like Headcase and Superbest Audio Friends, um, I spent time in both pl those places and I still, I, I don't spend as much time there as now as I used to because um, I, my work and what I do, I think, is um, adds in its own way. And when I was a manufacturer and starting Headroom and the hobby was small, um, and, and, you know, I started Headroom at a time when there weren't any headphone amplifiers and, and there really wasn't headphone enthusiasm until Headwise came along. And uh, so I always felt my job, I have to say on top of that, that the audiophile, audiophile world when I started um, Headroom was not very accepting of headphones. They are more accepting, a lot more accepting of headphones now than they used to be. Uh, so I, I felt it important to grow the headphone enthusiast activity. I used to say that my job at Headroom as CEO was to grow the fish and then grow the pond and then grow the fish and then grow the pond and then grow the fish. So I was one of the people who were, who worked with Aaron, um, at the first national meet at HeadFi, which later became the Can Jams. And um, so I thought that was, uh, so I, I was more working with the forums there to help the activity grow. Now there's no problem with the activity growing. It's, it's huge. Um, and so I don't feel like I have to participate in that way. And um, in terms of uh, expressing my opinions and the opinions of others, it's in a way it's incumbent upon me to develop my own opinions um, and when I speak them, it's through interfidelity. So I don't have a need uh, for uh, to spend a lot of times on forums talking. So I don't spend a lot of times on forums talking. Um, 
and then I'll talk about this in a different way because I don't want to be critical of HeadFi or Super Best Audio Friends or Headcase because I think all those places are, are important. Um, but I'll talk about motorcycle forums for a while, for a moment. I used to be on a motorcycle forum called uh, advrider.com, adventurerider.com. And uh, it's a huge forum. It is, I think it's about the size of HeadFi right now. And I was a moderator on that forum. And um, I had had the experiences on headphone forums of it splitting off. And, uh, and then I experienced the same thing at Adventure Rider, where there were splinter groups. They just weren't satisfied with what was going on on the large forum. Uh, and then less time ago, two or three years ago, I, was, uh, I started um, uh, looking at forums about building vehicles like Putt, uh, my truck, my, my uh, um, Outback camper truck. And um, there, too, there are some large forums. And uh, just recently, one of the forums there, Cheap RV Living, was the one that I found most to my, uh, uh, that suited what I was doing best. Um, it just recently had a splinter group form. So I, th I think the important thing to note here is that there is a place for both large forums and small forums. Large forums have the ability to get lots and lots of information and to sort through lots and lots of information. To uh, Whenever I do a headphone review, I always Google the name of the headphone and then site colon headfi.org to look at what people have said about that headphone. Uh, I always look at the Amazon reviews as well. Uh, but small forums have the opportunity for intimacy with each other. The bad thing about big forums is they can be very noisy. And uh, you can also have trolls and people that you don't like. And you just get a lot of people in the room at the same time. And on s smaller forums that splinter off from those groups, um, in my experience, most of, it, of it, most of the time, it's people who want to be closer to each other, to be friends with each other, um, and uh, um, develop personal relationships that is difficult to develop on a big board. Um, and so I think there's a, a place, a very important place for both types of forums. They both serve important purposes. Um, so, um, and, and I think they both end up having their own troubles as well. They, they can be difficult. Sometimes small forums, if you get somebody who's a troll, it can be real problematic. And I've, I've shouted somebody off a board before because I was sick of their baloney in a place where I wanted to be personal. At any rate, that's, uh, that's my thought on forums. I like HeadFi. I like Super Best Audio Friends. I like Headcase. Um, I like our headphones on Reddit. Um, I think there's a place for everything. And, and I think they all have their own flavor and that you should find the place that suits your flavor, you know, suits your fancy. And that's kind of it. Um, I guess the one thing that I would say about forums that's really, really important, and that is you should not push the post button about 20% of the time. When you write up a post, you should look at your post and say, am I really being positive or constructive here or am I just making noise? And um, I think pretty much everybody could not post about 20% of their posts. So that would be my advice on forums. Uh, things you think non-industry people don't know but should know about the industry profession. Well, I think the most important thing to know to know about headphones from the perspective of headphone manufacturers, and I can speak from personal experience experience on this, is uh, until you've been a manufacturer, you have no idea how hard it is. It is so hard to make a product. It, in the end, when you get the product and you put it on, you know, it's very easy to go to say, it's very easy to be a critic relative to making a headphone. It's very easy to be a reviewer relative to being the CEO of Headroom. Uh, 
that's very, very troublesome. You spend a lot of your time, you know, dealing with spammers on email or people getting pregnant and having to check out from work, but you need to have the job open for them when they come back or somebody got sick or, you know, parts aren't available or, you know, your suppliers gave you bad parts. Um, um, cost, the cost of the finished product may not be what you expect it to be and you have to make compromises there. It's, it's just one thing after another. And there's a saying um, in manufacturing, uh, which is it's time to shoot the engineer, which means at some point you got to put the product out there or you're not making money. You're not making an effect on the competitors. And, and it's just a huge, enormous, painful, trying, um, I don't have the words for it. It is a very, very hard thing to do. So my suggestion would be not to be too hard on manufacturers. It's very easy for me in this seat, and I try to do this very much. It's very easy for me to criticize. It's not so easy to really recognize and applaud the places where people do do, do good things at the same time. So, you know, I don't just criticize one thing and say it's not worth it. You know, generally speaking, I, I try to find all the good and the bad points and, and put that together. And, you know, I, I think we all have to understand that 10 years from now, headphones are going to sound a lot better. They're going to sound what we really want them to sound like. Um, and uh, that means the people producing headphones now are going to produce headphones that fall short and that you shouldn't think, Oh, they're such idiots. Why didn't they do such and such? It's not that easy. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I think sometimes I'm a little soft on folks. For example, Focal again. Um, I got a headphone and reviewed it. It turned out not to be quite the same as the manufactured product. It's, uh, later down the line, I went back and investigated it. But in the end, it's a, it's a product that makes a significant step forward in a number of ways. Um, it is a worthy product. It has some warts, like all headphones have warts, but I kept it on the wall of fame. It's just probably not going to be up there as long as I thought it would be in the beginning. Um, so I think it's important for all of us to understand and to give, to be a little bit graceful in our responses to manufacturers so that um, um, we encourage them more often than uh, be overly critical of them. Uh, um, it's very easy to criticize and, and not so easy to really offer applause when, the, when they've, it's worth it. Um, so um, manufacturing is hard. That's what, that's what you should know of, about the industry. Um, are the best headphones more accurate than floor standing speakers? Ho oh, ho, baby. Yes and no. Um, for one thing, with headphones, it's a totally artificial way to listen. Um, speakers, it's real sound coming to your ears through normal space, and, and you, can't, uh, you can't replicate that on headphones. Hell, we don't even know where flat is on headphones. Um, if the question is, is are headphones more accurate? Well, on the, on, the, on the very face of it, we don't even know what accuracy is for headphones yet. So we they can't be accurate because we don't know what the target is yet um floor standing speakers um th they can measure accurately and so on and so forth and so they can be accurate but i don't want to get hung up on accurate entirely here either um i would say answering the question in the ideal let's say we take the ideal speaker in the ideal in the ideal room and an ideal headphone i think uh, and I, I've said this for a long time, in terms of visceral impact and being immersed in the sound, headphones will never, ever be good as speakers. Because, well, well, I got a microphone thump there. You don't get chest compression. You don't get nasal cavity compression. Those things add to the palpable feel of sound when you're exposed to it, um, especially bass response and highly impacted sounds. And headphones just simply do not do that. There is no 
there's very little bone conduction from a headphone. There is a little bit of bone conduction, but you don't get the same sense. In terms of imaging, I used to say headphones will forever and always image better than speakers because they really are out in free space. And I think they still do. There's, you, you cannot get imaging on headphones like you get on speakers. Um, it, it just isn't there. Um, in Headroom's first amps, when I started this process, uh, my um, career in headphones, it was uh, um, uh, one, the, one of the features of the product was crossfeed, so it made it sound more like speakers. Well, nowadays, they're getting farther and farther along those lines with digital signal processing and virtual audio. And I, at this point, I do think there may come a time when headphones image as well as speakers and perhaps better uh, because of object-oriented um, audio and things like that, and, uh, it, it, they may be able to do things that speakers can't. For example, well, you do it in a surround system, you have re rear speakers. Uh, I was sort of talking about two-channel audio. But in headphones, it may be that you can really place discrete sounds exactly where they are rather than it being the sum of two speakers together. Um, it, synthesizing the sound coming from that particular angle or that particular angle. So in the future, once we get to object-oriented audio, and th that'll happen with games and virtual reality kind of things, um, not so much with music, although Sennheiser does work in uh, create, recreating uh, concert venues on headphones. Uh, and having head trackers so you can have the space stay in the right place and then try to couple it with video. So I think there's some, there'll be a time when headphones do some imaging better than speakers. Uh, but I think it's going to be a while. Speakers generally are better than that. In terms of resolution, the ability to pick out small sounds and, and little things, I don't think speakers will ever be able to touch what good headphones do. Again, we probably got to talk in the ideal here because I think speakers in general are 30 years ahead of headphones. I think we have a ways to go to catch up and have really accurate, truthful sound on headphones. Uh, but, um, but even now, many of you have had that experience. You get a good pair of headphones and you listen to some old Beatles tune and you hear John or Paul saying something in the background and you'd never heard it before on speakers. Speakers, the sound has to travel through the room. It has to, ha it undergoes reflections. Um, so there are disturbances to the leading transient edges of sounds uh, that um, don't happen on headphones. And so uh, we've all that ha had that experience. <gasps> I've never heard that before on headphones. And so I think in terms of resolution, headphones have the edge. Um, so accuracy may be a, a tough word in this thing, but I think there's a place. And of course, you can't take a pair of uh, speakers on the airplane with you. So headphones will always have an important place um, for enthusiast listeners. Should headphones be accurate or should they be good sounding? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I know Steve Guttenberg uh, and I have this conversation a lot, and uh, our opinions differ on this. Uh, I, I, I said, I, I think I said this before, that headphones have a long way to go, and um, so they, when they fall short, it's pretty obvious from the measurements that they're falling short. And, um, you know, I guess I have a higher bar for good sounding um, there's, there's not a lot of headphones that sound really good to me. Um, I don't, you know, maybe I'm just an objectivist at heart. Um, I, I, I want the headphones to disappear and I just want to hear the music exactly. And, um, and I've heard a lot of headphones. Uh, so um, they should be both. Um, and accurate, really accurate, truly accurate. I mean, a lot of times people say accurate sound, you know, something is accurate. Uh, it, 
in its automatically good, you know, as if it's automatically good sounding. But a lot of people use that word accurate in, 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 a, in the wrong way. Accurate is usually kind of bright sounding. In my experience, when a headphone gets close to the target curve, it sounds good. Um, and when the headphone is not close to the target good, uh, curve, it doesn't sound good. Uh, when I hear a speaker that, that has a 5 dB dip in it or a 5 dB peak in it, it doesn't sound good. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think it's important that, you know, both of those things are, are, will be true. But I, I will say something else, which is the more accurate a headphone becomes, the closer it is to the target response curve, um, the less... I am aware of of flaws or 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 faultiness. Um, wh what happens to, for me when a headphone is close, it begins to take on a character, um, liquid or uh, punchy or um, smooth or uh, like the Hi-Fi Man HE1000 has this. Um, sort of soft and fuzzy cloud-like sound to it or something. Um, and uh, it's not entirely accurate, but it has an, a nice sound to it, a character to it. Um, but it's close enough to accurate that it's okay. So I, I think that headphones that are close to the target curve, at some point, then the measurements don't begin to matter. Measurements matter when it's far out, you know, when they're far away. But as the as it gets closer and closer to accurate, at some point it, it just doesn't matter anymore because then what matters is the way the, um, ha what character appears. Um, w and when I say smooth or liquid or punchy. And those descriptors are purely subjective. They're, they have nothing to do with measurements. Something sounding liquid, you know, you could not really find a way to look through the measurements and say, oh, this is going to be a liquid sounding headphone. Uh, so once they get close, close enough, then it really does become um, the, the, the subjective character of the headphone that I experience. And, and it, it's, it becomes less technical. And there are a lot of people uh, who are willing, you know, your brain is a powerful, powerful thing. And um, a, a headphone, even a pretty mediocre headphone, uh, you can have a great listening experience on, but it has nothing to do with the headphone. It has to do with your willingness to enjoy it. Uh, I remember one time I was painting the walls at Headroom. It was late at night, and I had Muddy Waters playing on a boombox, you know, down the hall in a different room and uh, I was just grooving on the music and of course the sound was utter crap and so I, I, I when I review headphones I, I can't predict how you subjectively are going to experience that headphone and so mostly I try to to look at a headphone and how close it is it to neutral. I, I talk about its neutrality, and, and, or I investigate its neutrality first, and then once it really is close to neutral, then the characters start coming to mind, and I, and I start uh, talking about those characteristics and how they appear to me, and, and, uh, and I don't go too deep into that because your experience is gonna be completely different. They, they're, it comes a point where my review, it would be great for my reviews to be accurate. Do you want my reviews to be accurate or do you want them to be good, fun, a, a pleasant experience? Well, those two things are very different. And um, I want to produce reviews that are, you know, about a headphone's ability to be tr essentially transparent to the sound and then after that, that they, if they have a certain character to tell you, okay, this is the character they seem to have um, to me, but I, I don't go on and on about that because it may be different for you. It may be different for me on a different day, depending on how I feel. So 
um, it, it's, it's a tough, it's a sticky point. You know, there is this crossover when we talk about reproduced audio, there is this crossover between um, something is flawed because they're distant from accurate. And then as it comes closer and closer to being accurate, then the accuracy begins to not matter anymore. And um, it gets a little tricky for me, and that's when we all have to hear it with our own ears. Well, that's the end of uh, our questions for today. I hope you had fun listening to me ramble on. And I uh, hope you stick around and check out all the other videos that we're doing. There's some good ones in there. Um, you'll have some surprises uh, about stuff I do and things like that. So, see you guys next time.